Peace, peace. Assalamu alaikum. Shalom, shalom. Hotep, Islam, Alafia. What's going on, family? What's going on? We have a very exciting and informative episode here today with the turning and best selling author, Dr. Herbert Harris. All right, we have a very exciting episode for you today with entrepreneur, lawyer, and best-selling author, Dr. Herbert Harris. He will be joining us live momentarily. In the meantime, in between time, happy Monday, happy Monday. Happy Monday, everyone, happy Monday. How y'all doing today, how y'all doing? How's your Monday going, how's your Monday going? Where y'all from, where y'all from? Where y'all from, where y'all from? Happy Monday. If you can hear me, drop a book emoji. If you can hear me, drop a book emoji. If you can hear me, drop a book emoji. How's my audio? If you can hear me, drop a book emoji. Okay, okay. Peace, peace, family. Peace, peace. Episode number 45, episode number 45. Yes, yes, yes. How are you doing, Dr. Herbert Harris? How are you, sir? I am super today, man, and you? Awesome, I'm doing well, I'm doing well. Sorry for my tardiness, had to get everything set up. That, that is no problem, man. I'm just glad to be on the program and love the work you're doing. Indeed. Indeed. Um, same here, same here. How's my audio? You hear me good? Oh, yes. I can hear you well, and you hear me well? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, cool. So we're going to get started. I'm, I'm going to say I'm going to say your bio. Um, I'm going to introduce you, and then we can get started with the questions. Excellent. Cool. Assalamu alaikum, family. Shalom, shalom. Hotep Islam. Alafia. What's going on, family? Happy Monday. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. This is episode number 45, episode number 45. We're gonna get straight into it. All right, so meet Dr. Herbert Harris, a former attorney turned distinguished author and sought after speaker with renowned books like How to Make Money in Music and Power Thoughts for Your Success. He's an expert in marketing and wealth building, co-founder of Life Skill Institute, Inc., Based in North Carolina, he transforms lives through writing, public speaking, and mentoring, striving to impact at least 1 million people yearly with outrageous success. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, please welcome me, Dr. Herbert Harris. Thank you again, brother. Thank you again. Oh, oh listen, thank you for having me, man. I'm just super proud of what you're doing. and. To see brothers doing this, bringing enlightenment to the community, that is awesome. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So, um, Dr. Harris, can you explain uh, and talk about your upbringing and why did you decide to become an attorney? <laughs> That's very interesting. I grew up in the segregated South. I kind of bridged the gap between the, the X, Y, Z, A, B, C, and uh, the baby boomer generation. I grew up in the segregated South. I came to New York to be to attend an Ivy League school. So I just dated myself. <laughs> I attended the March on Washington Live as a college student. Wow. Okay. 1963. Yes, sir. And uh, one of the things that we saw in that era was the importance of law. You know, the whole civil rights movement was really based on law. Brown versus the Board of Education was the, to change the uh, separate but equal uh, the desegregation. And so really and truly all the battles in those days were mainly fought in the courtrooms because in those days the courtrooms were where a man could get justice, at least in the federal courts. And that inspired me, you know, that to be a part of that and that said, that drove me to actually study law, to become a lawyer, and to get on the battlefield. Awesome. Man, um, that's, that's very powerful. I, as you just stated, yes, uh, there was a lot of um, 
there was a, a lot of fighting uh, inside the courtrooms. And, and as you said, um, in the courtrooms is where we got our justice and um, we was able to enforce uh, legislation and, and make new policies um, for us to become better and, for, and for, for this generation, my generation, to live the lives that we're living, although things are still the same and some people will even argue things are worse. But um, just again, thank you, uh, brother, for your generation, for fighting and um, for doing the best that you guys could have only done, which was your best, yes. right? And yeah, you... One of the things that, that really disturbs me right now is the, over the years, since the integration movement, there has been a steady destruction of pretty much everything that made the black community strong. Mm. There, are fewer, there are fewer black men in medical school now than there were in 1970. Wow. And so when we came through the era of segregation, the, 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 the idea then was white people didn't want anything from you. They didn't want your money. They didn't want your body. And so as a black community, we had to really create our own economy. So when I grew up, I never talked to a white man really until I was 16 years old. Wow. And so we grew up in an economy where you had black plumbers, black cab drivers, black restaurants. Everybody dealing with you was black in school. Black right. teachers, black principals. Now it was under the guy of segregation. So as a black school, you never got new books. Mm. They felt comfortable giving the black school secondhand books. As black students, we didn't even take the college boards. We had a black, something called the merit scholarship. And most of us were trying to go to HBCUs because HBCUs were the only colleges really where you felt comfortable, right. where you felt family, right. where you felt belonged. I went to Columbia and Mike in, in New York City, Columbia University. And my experience there, and I was there in the early 60s, and my experience there was I never went back to the college for 35 years because it was not pleasant. I mean, it was not like the, the Georgia, Mississippi type racism, but it was a whole nother level of racism. And so the as a person now seeing the, the arc from that era when black people were pretty much self-dependent yeah. to this era now, now where based on the systems that are in place, we're in a, in a tough situation. Exactly. In a right. situation where one of the reasons we wrote the 12 Universal Laws of Success was not, was really to help people improve their condition. So that whatever's going on, the second law of success is the law of change. Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so if you're living in an environment where stuff is tough, where people really don't care about you, then there is always a way to get through it by changing your thinking and then acting on the new thoughts. So it, it all comes together. And, and what you're doing is so critical because with this, this movement now to destroy the truth. Yes. To close the books. It's really a, a movement by design. Not much that they don't want white people to learn about black history is that they want to create a dumb electorate because <laughs> yeah, think about it if white people don't <laughs> learn the truth they're ignorant it's black people who don't learn the truth right but the powers that be want to create a group of people who don't know anything about anything and therefore whatever you tell them they believe and, and we see it ha happening right now in, in the in the politics and in everything else that yeah most people can't tell a lie from the truth indeed now, um, uh, brother, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want us to go uh, too far ahead. Um, I want us to bring us back. A, I want us to bring us back a bit. Um, so you speaking on segregation. Um, my question to to that is: Do you think that your generation should have um, fought hard for integration? Well, you know, we got betrayed, and we got betrayed because when we fought for integration. 
our definition of integration was equal, equal access, equal power. But that was not their definition. So, okay. for example, we fought to integrate the schools. The same people that we had to fight, like in North Carolina, the Supreme Court decision was in 1954. We didn't integrate our schools until 1968. Wow. 10 plus years after. That's right. After every court challenge and every court battle had been fought, we finally integrated the school. But guess what? Once the schools were integrated, the same people who fought it were still in charge. They didn't get rid of the Board of Education. They didn't get rid of the politicians who had been fighting it. And so when we came into the system with the idea of, that, of integration, the idea perpetrated was their idea of integration and not ours. And so for them, integration meant close the black schools, bust the white black kids to the white schools and squeeze them all in the back. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know that we could have fought harder because we had we thought that we had done everything we needed to do. We, we were really trusting, trusting in God but trusting that people would be fair and righteous. But, you know, a mind changed against its will is of the same opinion still. And so that's where the, the definition of integration was really undermined from what we had in mind when we were sitting out on the picket lines, when we were right. there watching to listen to Dr. King. We had one thing in mind, but the people who controlled the levers of power had something else in mind. So we really got betrayed. We thought we had gotten a, a win, and it was not. It was an illusion. Indeed. Um, as Malcolm X once stated, may Allah be pleased with him, that you can't really be civil to an uncivilized people. Um, and instead of fighting for civil rights, we should have been fighting for human rights. Um, and so in 1954, as you just stated, uh, the Supreme Court ruled uh, segregation unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. um, and with, with that being said, um, we should have came together as a group. And if we seen that nothing was getting done, we should have continued fighting for, not for equality, because that's what we was fighting for, not for equality, but for independence, right? Continuing to um, be dependent on ourselves. And that's basically what a slave is, to be dependent upon another person. So if you're independent, you're not dependent on another person. You're self-reliant. You have your own communities. You have your own barbershops, supermarkets, banks, hospitals, houses, schools, so on and so forth. You're not dependent upon another person to do for you what you can, in fact, do for yourself. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to uh, put that out there. Obviously, again, thank you, Elder, for you and your generation's contribution to history and, 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 to, um, and to fighting for a great cause. Um, let's move on. So your classic book, which sold over 700,000 copies and counting worldwide, we're talking about the book, The 12 Universal Laws of Success. What was the aim and purpose for writing this book? The purpose to write this book was we wanted to give people a recipe book. You know, when you want to make a cake, you don't just think, I'm like, let me think of what it takes to make a cake. You go and you get a recipe book. And so what we wanted to do with The 12 Universal Laws of Success was create a recipe book that people could take wherever they were. If they were a young person, I was on a class the other day and a young man, 23 years old, was saying how this book changed his life. His mother was amazed. She said she, she never seen him pick up another book and read it from cover to cover. And so it was written for young people to say there are certain laws and certain rules. And if you follow these laws and rules, you can get a desired result. You can become successful. You can be free. You can become independent. It was written for older people you know a lot of folks in my generation when you look at the economy right now you know there's no such thing as a pension anymore <laughs> you know in my generation you work to get a pension now pension is dead so you better figure out a way to 
make your own money, manage your own money, and create a, a, a body of wealth for yourself. Right. So the book was written for people like that, to give them an understanding of the mindset to create wealth, happiness, joy, the, the, the principles involved, the, the law of change, how to change your thinking. Many times, if other people have been in charge of your education, your thinking may not be right. Right. And so the 12 universal laws of success says you don't have to be stuck in whatever the situation you're in now, right now. Think a new thought. So don't think about what somebody's got, you know, holding you back. Think about how your life would be if you could fly. If you get motivated by the flight, you'll figure out a way to get re get loose from whoever's holding you back. Mm. Mm, love that. So we have 12 universal laws of success. Can you give us your two most favorite universal laws for success? Well, I'll tell you, I think the two, they're really three. They're, okay. One of change is critical because we can get so involved with our condition. You know, someone once said, you can be so busy fighting alligators that you don't drain the swamp. <laughs> And so the law of change says that you can change your life by changing your thinking. So that gives you a way to get elevate from whatever your situation is. The second is the law of vision. Okay. And that gives you a goal. The vision, you know, the scripture says where there's no vision, the people perish. Yes. And now the Quran has a very similar translation. And so if you don't have a vision of what you want your life to be, then the world I will give you a vision. <laughs> if you don't walk in and say, I am here and I am the one, then the world will tell you to go to the back and sit down and shut up. <laughs> and so the law of change, the law of vision. And then I think the one that really helps us is the, the 11th law, which is the law of persistence. Mm. That if you can change, if you can see, then if you can hang in there, if you can keep plugging, if you can keep working, keep studying, keep doing whatever's necessary to get where you want to go, that you will get it. You know, many of our young people really would like to get a chance to share with them some of the, the learning techniques, you know, the, to learn how to be persistent, some of the steps to be persistent, the, how to open your mind and see more. If you can see more, you can be more. And so those three, those, those three laws, the law of change that you can change your life, the law of vision to give you something to shoot for, and the law of persistence to hang in there to get it. Mm. Man, so you talk about persistence, right? Um, these, these, these words are, um, is, is deep and is, is, is big um, to a degree. Persistence, and then you talk about uh, studying, right? Uh, a lot of people they may not know how to be uh, persistent right um they may have um many barriers that they have to overcome many challenges that they have to overcome and boom they quit right many people um uh, may be studying for the bar exam like yourself who passed and went on to become an attorney many people may be studying for um the lsat uh for whatever exam and they don't have the skill to study and to be persistent. And I know uh, in this book, The 12 Universal Laws of Success, you mentioned that there's a skill to effective studying. Um, now, I didn't even know there was a skill for that. Um, why, is, why is the skill of effective studying important for people? Well, you know, good brother, many of us are self-taught people. True. And so when you a self-taught person, the idea is you got to learn it. It's not like you're going to have to take a test and you cheat to, or uh, you cram to learn the test. You're learning the lessons of life. And so we, the, the SQ3R study method gives you a method, a way to approach anything you need to know. So S is the survey. And, and so whatever you're studying, if it's a book, if it's an article, don't just start reading it the first sentence, first sentence. Look at the entire article from top to bottom. Finger through the book and see how it's organized. See how the article is organized. Maybe when you go through the article, you see some headings of the paragraphs, some bold types. 
If you are looking at a book, you may see chapter headings and content. Look at the table of contents. And what this does now, it's all about conditioning your mind to be open and receptive to learn. So now you're creating in your mind, you know, aha, this is how this works. S, survey. Q is question. Based on your survey now, you should have some questions. See, learning is an activity. Learning is just as much as an activity as basketball. <laughs> okay. If you don't go to basketball, you remember Allen yep. Iverson? Remember yes. Allen? And mm -hmm. one of the things he had, he didn't like to practice. Okay. Allen always felt like he was good. He didn't need to practice. And it, it and the way it looked, I mean, I mean, he the proof is in the pudding. He was awesome. I mean, but he set up a bad model for other people who did need to practice. True. And so survey questions, set up these questions about what you expect to learn. When you challenge your mind with questions, you're preparing your mind to receive. So set up the questions. This book is about maybe a book on uh, horse racing. This is about horse racing. This is a book about success. It has 12 chapters and these are the chapter heads. But what I, what should I learn from this book? I'd like to learn how to be successful. I'd like to learn how to make money. I'd like to learn how to get more focused. So these questions now stimulate your mind. And then R, the three R, R1 is to actually read it. Mm. And now many of us have gotten, when I was learning this technique in college, I had to do it to teach myself certain subjects. I didn't read fast enough. Okay. And so I actually went and, and took a course. So many of our listeners, if there's something that you're not good at, that you need to get where you want to go, go learn it. Take a course. Invest in yourself. Right. Take a course in it to read faster. So read it. And that's R1. R2 is review it. And I'm a firm believer. I, when I write, read a book, I make notes, man. I write all on the page and under the line stuff because when you read it and make those notes, R2 is to review it. So now you come back and you can see some of the little notes you made on the stage, on the side of the page. You can see some of the places where you underlined, you see. And then R3 is to recite it. And see, this is one point that people often miss. Once you recite it, it's a lot like a bicycle. You know, when you learn how to ride a bicycle, you can come along 20 years later, you haven't touched one, and you'll be a little wobbly at the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> get, get, get up on that thing. And similarly, when you recite whatever you have learned from that article, so the 12 universal laws of success, I know the law of thought, the law of change, the law, of, when you can recite it, then now you have it in your mind and nobody can take it away from you. I worry about the the Google generation where a person say, well, what's the, what's the law of value? And they Google it and they say, aha, uh -huh. the law of value deals with how you exchange time for money, for example. Mm -hmm. And then they go on back about their business. You ask them later tomorrow, what's the law of value? They're going to let me Google it again. And so that idea of reciting the information challenges your mind to keep it. Because as long as you have an active mind, your mind is just like those same muscles that you use to shoot that basketball. Right. When you keep your mind active and reading and reviewing and reciting, then you give yourself a good foundation to go forward. So that's what the SQ3R method is. Survey, question, read it, review it, recite. I love it. I love it. Survey, question, read it, review it, and recite it. Man, I would even add. Uh, uh, I would even add that after reciting it, right, that um, people should uh, apply and execute Woo! the information because that's where we stop at. Mm -hmm. we, we we just stop at reading it. We just stop at retaining the information and obtaining the information, and then that's it. Um, but to even take it a step further. We can apply the knowledge, right? Um, a lot of people like to say that knowledge is power. Uh, I personally disagree with that because you can have all the books, you can go to all the schools, classes, get all the certification, but if you don't put that into practice, then all of that is useless. That is just useless. So the application of that knowledge will grant you the power that you need to go. The execution, right? We need to execute and apply 
uh, these informative and insightful uh, information and readings in order to become successful, right? In order to become powerful, because that's what we're missing. We're missing the application. We're missing the action, right? To become an activist, what do you have to do? You have to act. <laughs> People just don't call themselves activists. No, they actually put in the work, because right? yes. that's the base word of activist, yes. is to act, right? Um, so I think that's a, a very uh, critical and, and vital part that we're missing, um, that is to act upon the information that we're receiving. Um, so our model, DTR360 Books' model, is apply knowledge is true power. Yeah. Apply knowledge is true power. But action validates knowledge. As you say, knowledge without action is just a wish. Knowledge with action gets results. Indeed. Indeed. One of the, as a matter of fact, the seventh law of success, the law of action, we actually break down the steps to take action because a lot of times when we look at action, it's important to know how to act, how to plan, how to lay it out. You know, when you're in the military, there's always a plan. There's always a battle plan. There's always a strategy. And so when you can act with a strategy, when you can act with a plan, then you can literally create the things you want to do, be, and have. That action is critical because oh. without action, you do you just blowing smoke. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, so now let's uh, switch gears a bit. Um, you said back uh, at the inception of this interview that uh, in 1963, the March on Washington, you was around your teenage year, right? Yep. Um, which is uh, which is great. Uh, which is great. And you look great, by the way, for your age and your um, skin and, and everything like that, right? Um, so you... I've seen a couple of your videos and you speak about health a little bit, health yes. and wellness. Yes. How important is health to you? Well, you know, there's an Arabian proverb and it says that he who has health has hope. He who has hope has everything. So without your health, it's, it's a non-starter. You know, one of the things that over the last 14 years, I, I was on a project with Montel Williams and Montel, you know, has MS and he's falling out of airplanes. He's had some serious health challenges and and he really helped me focus on health. I was a, I was a good friend of Dick Gregory, you know, Dick Gregory back in the day. And when Dick went from being a smoking, drinking, 350 pound comedian to being a 145 pound, thin, brilliant, you know, activist, I said, Dick, what's up? And he said, hey, man, your body is your temple. Mm. He said, people People dig their grave with their fork. Wow. <laughs> with what they eat. And so I became committed then to really watch my weight, watch my diet, be aware of what I eat. I've been working for the last 14 years. Uh, we call it the secret, <laughs> the secret weapon because uh, I've been uh, with a, a nutrition and, and wellness program, a product that has been really changing my life. And, uh, you know, it, it's one of the kind of things that product called Perpandum, you may not have heard of it, but a, a product that's really transformed my life. It helps rebuild the body from the inside out. And so uh, health is critical. I have a whole health team that we work together because without that help, everything stops, man. You, you, when you see your friends who have a health challenge and how it devastates, man, you know, they, you know, they often say, most people live one or two paycheck, paychecks away from bankruptcy. Yeah. Well, imagine what happens, person when, what happens when a person gets sick and they can't work for six months. I mean, it breaks your heart when you see their home, the, uh, you know, foreclosed there. And you know, the, a capitalist system, they don't care about your feelings. Right. <laughs> yeah. So health has been critical. Our whole program at our website, herbertharris.com, that we share information and health tips. And for any of your listeners, you can always go to our website, herbertharris.com and subscribe because we try to share, they say knowledge is power, but as you said, apply knowledge is power. But I can at least give you the knowledge. You may or may not apply it, but that's one of our goals to give you knowledge about 
how to keep yourself healthy, how to keep your mind sharp, how to keep your skin looking good, because everything comes from the mind. You know, a lot of people get old because they decide they want to get old. My dad lived to 93, and he worked right up to like six months before he died. Wow. And he said, porches kill people. I said, what do you mean, Pop? He said, anybody who sits on the porch and does nothing, they're dead in two years. Mm. And so maintaining health, keeping your nutrition, understanding how your body works, prepares you now to do all the other great things. Indeed, yes. yes. <laughs> health is critical. As you just said, if you don't have health, you don't have nothing, right? So uh, a lot of people, they, you know, they make all of this money. Um, Steve Jobs had all the money in the world, but yet he, he still died, right? Because he didn't take care of his health. Um, so, um, and, and we just, I don't know if you've seen, uh, it was just this, um, social media influencer, uh, she was a vegan and she just died of starvation, right? So I, I, I haven't read into it. I don't know if she was fasting, if she was, I don't know what, but they said that she died of starvation, right? So you have to make sure and eat, you have to make sure and, um, put nutrients inside your body, right? There's a balance to everything. Yeah right so yeah. um definitely health is key yes yeah. but make sure that you're eating the right foods make sure that you're eating the right vegetables you're eating the right fruits so that you can live a, a long healthy life as martin luther king jr said that um a, a, a long a longevity right uh, he he want to live until he's you know 90 plus 100 years old because longevity has its place in life yes yeah well, can you imagine if you can maintain your life? Now, now I'll tell you my personal goal. My personal goal is 160. Wow. I'll be 160 in 2104, okay? And I'm projecting that ahead. Mm -hmm. Now, a person can say, that's crazy. Herb. That doesn't make sense. Hey, what you believe can happen. True. It's based on your level of consciousness now you got to develop a level of consciousness that's congruent with living 160 years. you got to develop a level of consciousness that takes care of your body, that understands how the body reproduces. Or every cell in your body reproduces about every 11 months. you got a whole new body. So to understand those kind of things. But I tell you, good brother, it's maintain your health. Water mm. is deep. The body is 70% water. And most of our illnesses are rooted in water and free radical damage. So the lack of water. Yeah, lack, lack of water. You see, you have, I was reading, um, a young man was, a study was saying that whatever your body weight is, you should drink half that amount in water. So if you're 200 pounds, you should drink 100 ounces of water every day. And over the day, space during the day. And I find that one of the things that makes your skin look good is when you water, consistent water during the day and develop a routine. One of the keys that I have learned over the years is that if you don't schedule it, it won't happen. And so, you know, we in the book, we talk about read your goals three times a day. Anybody who reads their goals over three times a day, seven days a week, 365, okay? They read their goals every day. Those goals are going to manifest. But if you don't say what time you're going to read them, you get to the end of the day and you're like, oh, man, I forgot to read my goals. And so whatever things that you have to do, schedule when they must be done. So I read my goals at 7 a.m., at 12 noon, and 9 p.m. It just takes a minute. Just a couple of sentences to read it. But just that type of regimentation will help you with your self-discipline, will help you with your persistence. And so for the people listening, whatever you want to do, schedule when it must be done. Because if you don't schedule it and set a time to do it and leave enough time to get it done, chances are it won't happen. Indeed, man, these are family. These are wise words coming from the elder. So definitely take heed. These are wise words coming from the elder. So definitely take heed. Um, as you just said, uh, brother, um, we can give out the information. We can give out the knowledge. But it's up to you, family. It's up 
to the person to apply that knowledge. We can lead a horse to the, to the water. It's up to that horse to drink the water, right? So um, definitely, family, it's up to you. I can provide you with the books, but it's up to you to read it. It's up to you to read and apply the knowledge, right? Because people could only do but so much, right? But it takes you to do the work. It takes you to apply. It takes you to set that goal, put it in motion, apply, execute, and achieve that goal, right? But as you said, oh, it all starts with the mind because what the mind can conceive, you will achieve. Man, let's move on. So speaking about that, uh, you have a mentorship program as well. Yes. Right? What yes. does the word what does the word mentor mean to you and why do you do it mentor is like, like a guide a guide you know when when you're exploring a, a climbing a mountain you always have a guide you never have a guy just say i'm going to go out there and climb mount everest all by myself <laughs> you have a guide and so a mentor is a guide not a person who does it for you but a person who asks some of those questions you know i look at mentorship is a sounding board. And so when you, you share an idea with me and I ask you when I'm doing a, a, an intake to decide whether we want to work together, I'll ask you, well, what's your why? Why, why, why are you calling me? Why, why, why do you want to do this? And if a person's not clear on their why, then I say, let's get down to what's really, really important to you. So as a mentor to help a person determine what's really important, because once they know what's big, what's important to them, then they can build their value system. Once you build their value system, now they can make their plans. If you don't have value, for example, if you don't value your time and you give, give your time away and you're always late and unprepared, then that's a challenge. I don't care how many books you read, you can right. go and get, you can, there are coaches that will take your money. I would not even take a person on as a mentee if I didn't think they could do it, and then I didn't think we could get it done together. You know, it's like, it's not about the money, but it's like, hey, when we talk, I see that you are in the ballpark. Let me try to help you focus on what's important to you. I, I don't want to read your mind because the only thoughts that are going to be important are the ones you have for yourself. But let me be like a flashlight. Let me guide your sight a little bit and say, hey, look over here. You see that? You ever seen that before? No, you need to check that out because that could help you. Yeah. And so that's kind of my, my concept of mentorship. And, you know, once again, on our website, herbertharris.com, we set up interviews. We have a, a calendar program there. And uh, I'm happy to interview people and talk. To them. I, I don't mentor a lot of people just because I take it very personally. You know, like when my mother was a school teacher and she said, if the te if the student fails, I fail as a teacher. Mm. And I feel that as a mentor, you know, that's why I'm very, when I, I select the person to work with, I say, okay, I, I think you got it, man. You just need to be a little direction, a little refinement, a little encouragement. You know, many times, many of us, I tell you, many of us are eagles raised by turkeys. Wow. Say that again, brother. Many of us are eagles raised by turkeys. Mm. Now, this is not saying anything bad about your family because your family is your family. When the creator brings you into the world, the creator brings you to the world based on the creator's consciousness. So maybe your parents didn't have an education. Maybe they were even on drug, Whatever their situation was, you still an ego because the creator made you an ego. <laughs> and so when you're raised by turkeys, it's an ego who doesn't think he can fly. But, you know, I think, I'm sure that you've experienced it. When you get out into the world and you start doing things, you see stuff and you say, man, I want to do that. Right. I want to be there. I want to have that. And you talk to all your friends and family, they go like, oh, man, stay on the porch. You know, I know somebody who tried that. They went broke. I know somebody else who did, you know, all the negative stuff. But when egos feel that thing inside, and I say this to our listeners, man, if you feel that thing inside that you really want it. And that's why your why is so important. You really want it. You love doing it. You're good at it. You just got to figure out how to make money. That's all. Speaking of your why and your purpose, um, many people that I speak with 
Um, and I'm also a school teacher. Uh, and so actually we were speaking on our why today, like why, like, what is our why? Right, because um, teachers, that's a very uh, difficult job <laughs> to have. Um, so we often speak on our why. What is our why, right? Um, and, and what brings us back each year, which is predicated on our why. Yeah. So that being said, um, most people don't know what their why is and what their purpose in life is. Mm. How can people find their why and their purpose? Well, you know, that's an excellent question. In the book, on page 77, there's a whole piece there on how to develop your purpose. And, and once again, it's asking yourself those questions and then being honest with yourself. Am I the person I really want to be? You, know? you, you have to say that, hey, uh, if you are, then, then hallelujah, go ahead. But say, well, no, I'm not the person I really want to be. Well, then uh, am I living a meaningful life? Mm. Oh, I'm not. Okay, well, well, what do I need to do to live a meaningful life? And then once you start asking those kind of questions, you say, well, what do I love doing? Because if you, your pers purpose will always, and your why will always revolve around what you love doing. Okay. You see, because when you find something you love doing, you really do it for free. And so when they ask that, what do you love doing? You know, I love that. What do you love? What do you not love to do? What are some things you don't like doing? Well, like I know I'm a writer, okay? I don't particularly like leading groups. I like to be the speaker, but I don't like to be the organizer. <laughs> okay, so many times we spend our life doing stuff we're not good at. And so in that why to really keep asking those questions, well, why do you want to speak? Okay. I want to speak because I like speaking. Why do you want to speak? I want to speak because I want to touch people. Why do you want to speak? I want to speak because I want to see people move up to their higher good. Why do you want to speak? Because I want to create a certain environment around me of people like me who love to do good and be good. Right. So when you go through that process of finding what you love, what you're good at, what you don't love, then look at things like, does whatever you want to do hurt other people? Does it help other people? You know, some, some desires we have may be fine for us, but if it hurts other people, it's something you have to back away from. Yeah. Does what you want to do add value to your life? You know, like some people say, man, I love to get high. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Drink beer all day long. Does that add value to your life? No. Right. So as a teacher, you know, as uh, you know, what does it add value to your life? I'm sure that when you look at your students and you interact with when they're successful, but when they're able to do be and have some of the things they're seeking, that makes you feel good. That adds value to you. And so, all of those are those those questions that you ask yourself, and that's why you have a mentor because they can push you a little bit. You know, so don't get out of your comfort zone. Get out of your comfort zone. A lot of times we live a lives based on Everybody else's expectations. You know, many times we live a whole life trying to live their parents' dreams or their friends' dreams or their, their race dreams. And so all these things will help you center on who you really are and what your purpose is. Man, I'm, I'm loving this discourse right now. I'm loving this discourse. So much information, so much wisdom that is being bestowed upon us here this evening. We're gonna take a quick commercial break um, and we're gonna come right back. Family, family, if you wanna see the whole interview, definitely click the link in our bio and subscribe, subscribe to our YouTube channel, DTR360 Books. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, DTR360 Book, and hit the notification bell. Uh, we will have this full interview up momentarily. Um, also, also, man, visit our website, dtr360books.com. Visit our website, dtr360books.com, and you can find all kinds of books possible from religious books, children books, spirituality books, history books, self-help books, motivational books, any books that you are looking for, you can find at dtr360books.com. 
all right also you can subscribe to our um audio podcast we have we're on spotify we're on google podcast we're we're on audible any podcast that you are on we're on so definitely subscribe support um by the badge at the bottom of the screen that you see right here and support because once again once this information goes out it helps other people because this is valuable information that needs to be dispersed into as much people as possible all right so um we are concluding this uh interview again uh, the thank you for your wisdom and thank you for your time so i have a couple more uh questions if you don't mind um, how can we bridge the gap between the youth, like myself, and elders, like yourself? Well, a lot of it's on the elders. The elders got to be more, um, it's like, I'm like affirmative action among elders. Elders got to reach out. Because some of the elders are halfway scared of the kids. <laughs> you know, they see the kids a certain kind of way, talking a certain kind of way. But what I have found is that if you're open, you know, I, I live in a, in, we call it the hood. Now it's like a very fashionable, you can't even buy a house around here for under half a million dollars. Wow. A little bitty house, okay? This used to be a traditional black neighborhood and now, you know, it, it gentrification, et cetera. But a lot of times the young people pass by. And so I speak to them as an elder, just reach out. That helps bridge the gap. How you doing, young fella? How you doing? And it's amazing, you know, like, because some of my friends, they're like, man, I, I'm not going to speak to this brother. This brother got hair, hair is tore up on his head. And I'm like, he never combed his hair this year. That's okay. What's in his mind? So uh, the the elders have to reach out a little bit more and just, you know, not to convert, not to kind of, like, hey, man, how you doing today? What's up, brother? You doing okay? Yeah. And just creating that and set a platform for dialogue. So that's key. And with the young people, people the bible says seek and you shall find you know it's important to validate the elders and talk to them with an open mind you know don't talk about what you should do and what does not work but talk with an open mind and i i recommend young people write down three questions that you would like to answer to from somebody who's been wherever you want to go <laughs> okay and start that kind of dialogue. Because one of the things you find is that when a young person asks me a question, man, I'm open. Mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, I was coming up the street, and a young man, three young men were coming up the street. They were sagging, you know, all the things that they say about the young people. And so um, I, I said, hey, folks, how you doing? He said, oh, sir, he said, I have a question. He said, what do I have to do to have a house like that and a car like that? I said, well, you need to stay in school, all right? So you need to get an education and you need to really want it badly and be committed, never quit. And then I asked him, I said, what are you doing now? He was a student in college. Wow. Okay, now, now that to look at him, I wouldn't have thought that, you know, right? You know, so, but the whole point was that opened a whole nother dialogue. But the funny thing was, a year later, that young man came by. I didn't recognize him, man. He was suited and booted. Wow. <laughs> Haircut. And he said, hey, Mr. Harris. He said, man, I just, I was passing down. I, and he said, man, I just want to thank you. He said, man, you remember we talked to me? And I was like, kind of remember. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he said, I'm dead. And he said, when I got back to school, I asked him, oh, I, I told him, I said, I, I said to him, if you're in college, you need to get into a, one of those, um, uh, what do you call it, the, the uh, where you go to uh, work in the uh, in a company. Um, you may not even be paid. Um, ooh, oh, intern. Oh, yeah. okay, right. Yeah. Right. Internship. Said, yeah, when he said he was in college, I said, well, hey, you should find out about the internship. Young man said, he asked, nobody ever told him at the college about the internship. He asked, and they said, yeah. Yeah, the interns, he was kind of tall. He wanted to be a basketball player at some point too, but he ended up getting an internship working with one of the sports organizations. And he nice. let me 
know, he said, man, I'd have never done that if I hadn't talked to you. So long story short, my generation be open and try to create the dialogue. We, we often have to initiate the dialogue and just do that, not to, to complain, but say, hey, fellas, how y'all doing today? What's up? Mm -hmm. And then to the young people to pick out somebody who you admire and go ask them three questions, write down three questions and go ask them. That can start a lot of dialogue that can help you. Right, and that's a way of initiating the conversation as well and initiating the dialogue. Um, if that young brother hadn't come up to you and asked you about your house and your car, um, that, you know, that relationship wouldn't have fostered. Right. Um, so, you know, shout out to the young brother for having the courage yeah. to come up to you and ask you a question like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and how, good, yeah, yes. Thank goodness that young people, you know something, Young people are the future. The whole civil rights era was young people. Old people in the in the fifties and the sixties. Old people were scared to death. <laughs> okay, they've been conditioned under all that you know discrimination. So young people, when the the young men sat in at the the lunch counter in Greensboro, they were like eighteen years old, yeah. nineteen. I think the oldest one was nineteen. And so the young young people are the future. And so we got to make this connection with the past so we can tell you where the potholes are because you are the ones that have to carry the ball. Indeed. Um, so speaking of the youth and the youth being the future, how important is reading and education? It's critical. It's absolutely critical because the African proverb says that the man who never leaves home thinks his mother is the best cook. And so reading can expand your horizon. You can read about places you've never heard of before, never seen before. Reading is critical. Getting an education. Your mind is the most powerful tool that God gave you. Your mind is more powerful than the computers. They have, the computers are trying to do what your mind's been doing for millions of years. Right. Okay. And so it's important to get an education, get exposure, Get out of a rut. I'll, I'll say that there are four keys that I, I'd like to sort of close with, for you, especially for our young people. Yes, sir. One is to realize that it's all about the mind. Success must be in your mind first. And so get a vision of what success leads, means to you, what you want to be, what you want to do, what you want to have. Tyler Perry wanted the right plays. He was willing to do whatever it took sleep in his car, the right place. Steve Jobs wanted to build computers. He's working in his garage. They, he, you, you know how much they discouraged him and they said, here you come along with a company in your garage and you're gonna go up against a giant like IBM? You must be crazy. So success must be in your mind first. Number two, be constant in, in your efforts. Don't get a little victory and wanna give yourself a break. When stuff starts going, for you push harder work harder never take a rest never take a break from your success journey rest and get your keep your body together but stay on the path number three get away from the crowd at the bottom there are a lot of people that can't take the journey with you you can lead a hundred but you can't carry one and you lead by being an example so Get away from the crowd at the bottom. Believe me, there are a lot of people that are going to say, you stuck up, man. You ain't the way you used to be. You used to be fun. Now you want to do it and think and travel. I guarantee you, when you get to be successful the way you're going to be, they'll all be there like, yeah, that's my man. <laughs> we grew up together. And then finally, number four, be willing to change your life completely. If you don't change what you're doing, you're going to continue getting what you're getting. But if you change what you're doing, you create a whole new outcome. You can't make a new beginning. The past is the past. There's a reason why your rear view mirror is much smaller than your windshield. Because the past is for instruction, but the windshield, the future, is for inspiration and motivation. So be willing to change your life completely and be willing to work as long as it takes to get whatever you want. Always.
best is yet to come. Yes, yes, the best is yet to come. And we're going to end on that, family. The best is yet to come. And change is the only thing that is constant, right? It's the only thing that is constant. So make sure that you change. Change for the better. Change for the better. Read. I say all the time, family, if, you, if, you, if you've been following me for a while, you know that I'm big on reading. You know that I'm big on education. Hence, my company, DTR360 Books. Um, reading is, is very uh, valuable. Um, Frederick Douglass, uh, he, he once said that knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave, right? So the knowledge that you have, this is why they enslaved us and they told us not to read so that we wouldn't have the knowledge, so that we wouldn't have the critical thinking skills to do what we need to do and, and, and to be, again, that word, independent, right? So if we don't have knowledge, if we don't read, then we are dependent on someone else, again, to do for us what we can do for ourselves, right? So, and I will leave you with this, family. There was never a time in history that we walked on all fours. I'm going to say that again. There was never a time in history that we as Aboriginal and original human beings walked on all fours. So we are the parent to this planet Earth. We are the parents, the mothers and the fathers of this planet Earth. So let's act like it and let's get on and get back on our throne, okay? And we have to do that by being educated. We have to do that by working together in collaboration. We have to do that by having humility and acting, acting, executing, and applying what we've read and what we've studied. Elder, I'm going to give you the last word. Any last words before we close out? Well, number one, I'd love to have you visit our website, herbertharris.com. And one of the things that we have prepared for all of our people, the young and old, but particularly for young people, is something called the Success Toolbox. It's like a recipe book for success. And so go to our website, herbertharris.com and check out the success toolbox. We put everything in it to get anything you want. And there's a final word that you can be anything you want to be. It's absolutely no limitation. You can do anything you want to do. The world is your oyster. The world is your ocean. You own it all. And you can possess and enjoy anything you desire. Always know me that the best is yet to come. The Brother best. Elder, uh, thank, you for, um, thank you for being here. Thank you for your energy. Thank you for your knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Uh, family, again, you can click the link in the bio, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to our YouTube channel. Um, again, dtr360books.com. That's the website for all your book needs. We are the book club. Family, I leave you. I, I greeted you. Assalamu alaikum. Shalom, shalom. Hotep, Islam, Alafia. Peace.